from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. So before I tell you a little bit about the author, I need some audience participation. If you've ever had a taco in this country, enjoyed a taco, stand up. I want to show her something. Stand up. This, this is Taco Nation, right? Here we are. I, I mean, you know, like, what better food in the world and why wouldn't she make a Tacopedia book? It just seems like a, a natural. Um, she brought with, uh, she brought uh, the, the, uh, sp the, the Spanish version. I have the, uh, the English version is why we're here today and that was first published in 2015 and republished this year. And it's just a treasure trove. It's on my desk as a reference at work, of course. Um, in addition to the really cool map, which is why it's called Tacopedia, um, you just get to find out all kinds of things. Plus she's managed to fit, you know, from my perspective, like six or eight recipes on a single page, like that's unheard of in the cookbook world. Um, and part of the reason why she got to do this is for what she wrote in the book, which I'll explain in a minute. But to give you a little bit of her, a little bit of her background, Deborah Holtz is the co-founder and director of her country's Trilce Ediciones. I've butchered that, I know. Um, it's a publisher best known for its popular culture books as well as poetry books and children's books and essays. And the editors and publishers themselves are well-trained and their geographical position makes them ideal to talk about Latin America as well as the United States. She also serves as president of the Mexican Alliance of Independent Publishers. And she has said that her company has sought to introduce risky and different books aimed not only at the Mexican market, but at international markets. Because Mexico's proximity to the United States is beneficial in this way. The U.S. has the world, this, and this is the author's words, the U.S. has the world's largest Hispanic population and ethnicity, and which is about to become the country's second largest ethnic minority, of which 34 million people are either Mexican or of Mexican heritage. And that, so that represents, as you can imagine, a good marketing opportunity for people in her business. Now about Tacopedio itself, um, I'm also going to use her and her co-author Juan Carlos Mena, who did the many illustrations and great design of the book. She says, it occurred to me there must be something deeply rooted in our culture that makes tacos this culinary wonder loved by the whole world that ensures the tacos, our peerless contribution to the culinary universe, are perfectly cooked, that the salsas have just the right level of spice, and that the tacos are filled at five o'clock in the after five o'clock in the morning as if it were two in the afternoon, and served to people of all social classes. She realized that like un, unlike any other dish, tacos are the one of the most definitive traits of Mexican culture. And so to pay tribute to it, that's how they came up with this book, and she'll tell you all about it. And she's explained to me through this book what Tacos Al Pastor is, and I thought I knew that as a food professional. So without further ado, Deborah Holtz. Hello, thank you everybody for, for being here. I'm very, very incredibly excited. This is the first time I come to this fair. It's a very uh, different fair from the ones I used to, or I, I'm used to go, like the book fairs in uh, Mexico and other countries that are basically publishers that put their stands, etc. And being here in this author feast is really amazing. I uh, would like to thank especially the Mexican Embassy, our ambassador, Alberto Fierro, and uh, from the Institute, Cultural Institute of Mexico and Gustavo, and obviously the people at the National Book Festival for having the brilliant I idea of having three Mexican authors today in this festival. I think it is important to make a stand. I am Mexican and I'm very proud of it. I don't think that's being a criminal. So being here before you is great. And I thank you all for being here and listening to this taco 
presentation, I made uh, this PowerPoint so it could be clearer why we thought that, uh, as Bonnie was explaining, that we needed a taco book uh, being such an obvious thing. And uh, well, we, uh, I suddenly realized, as any other Mexican does in a taco place at five o'clock in the morning after coming from a party, we all go to have tacos before going to bed. I know that's not very recommended by a doctor, but that's what we Mexicans do at all times of the day. So I went to this party, and after the party at five o'clock, we went to a taco place, and uh, you know, a bit drunk, dipsy, and I was uh, there, you know, sitting at the table, and suddenly I was looking at the at the taquero, the guy that makes the tacos, and uh, I was amazed at the, the the speed at which he could make a taco, like ten thousand, I don't know how many tacos by the minute. The woman from the salsa had the salsa ready. The, the waiter had already cleaned the table. The tortilla woman had the tortilla right on the dot, hot, because everything with a taco has to be done in the minute. And I started thinking, wow, these guys are amazing. They didn't go to the uh, fast food university or anything, you know. Something must be happening that all of us are sitting here at five o'clock in the morning, people that are going to work, people like me that are half drunk, you know, coming from a party. And so there must be something in our DNA that, that explains why all this is happening. So I had this like eureka moment <laughs> of doing a tachopedia because I thought uh, that this, uh, reflected uh, not only a dish, you know, something you eat like, you know, a pizza or a burger, which are great kinds of food, but this, you know, has uh, had roots way beyond uh, the time we were living in our past, and obviously uh, with all the, the pre-cultures uh, of Mexico, the Aztec, etc. So that's how it all started. It took us four years to, uh, you get together all the information, and uh, this is a presentation I put together for you. So, uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I have to. <laughs> okay, so, uh, well, the, as Bonnie said, the book was first published in Spanish. Um, I'm going to show you images of the book published in Spanish, but the uh, we're fortunate enough to have it now published in English by Faden, a Faden, a, a great publishing house. And so, well, the obvious question, and this is how it all started, is what is a taco? It may seem an obvious question, everybody knows what a taco is, but not really everybody. <laughs> okay. <laughs> This guy is sitting in front of a basket something, saying he loves Hispanics. I don't think uh, Mr. Trump knows the difference between Mexicans and Hispanics, and he certainly does not know what a taco is. So this image of, you know, made me very happy that we have a tacopedia. If one of you can later send him a book, I will be very grateful, and all of the Mexicans will. <laughs> so. Well, there you have the commentaries. A taco bowl is just a taco with a big, beautiful wall around it, which I love. And uh, the best taco bowls are made by immigrants who resent a rich prick calling them rapists. Love an authentic Mexican. So, well, and uh, it, it seems, you know, I'm, I'm very happy for this translation because uh, when we talk about tacos, there seems to be like a confusion, you know? All countries export their main dishes, obviously, Italians, Chinese, etc. But Mexican food, for obvious reasons, became very popular in the United States, but especially because of the large changes. Taco Bell and then Chipotle, which have uh, loads of restaurants, and there you can see um, the importance of Mexican food in the United States. So it's uh, now $43 billion, uh, dollars what, what, it, what it makes in the food market in the United States. And obviously the largest chains uh, dominate the market. So 
um, I think there's a big difference between a real taqueria, where, which we have there, and the Taco Bell. And the tacos that Taco Bell uh, calls tacos and a real taco. So um, uh, thank you for the opportunity of talking about the real tacos. So this is a Tacopedia published in English. And um, the first uh, pages we wanted to, since it was all born in a taqueria, in many taquerias in Mexico, this is the way they tell you what tacos you can order. So we figured we would do the index of the book like you see the tacos in a taqueria. And um, as you might see, and we will see later on, we have uh, 16 types of tacos, and we'll be talking about them. So just to make the point, for example, this is a taqueria, nothing to do with Taco Bell. So uh, Alejandro Escalante, who is the guy who did the research, and we work very close together with him, me and my partner, Juan Carlos Mena, who is responsible for the design, believe that um, tacos is uh, the very backbone, the heart of what Mexica, being Mexican is. It is, uh, uh, you know, in the, the bottom of our hearts, it's not just the food we eat, it's a whole representation of our way of understanding life, our way of relating to each other, and obviously, when we say we want to eat, we have the synonymous uh, expression of, I'm gonna eat a taco, even if you're gonna have a chow mein, you know? Having a taco is synonymous for us for eating. And tacos are uh, very ancient in our culture. The, the first uh, tortilla is believed to be uh, invented 1,000 years uh, before Christ. And so uh, we wanted to begin with this book explaining where the tortillas and where maize came from. So um, uh, the, the first you know, thing to know is that tortillas obviously come from maize. Maize is a plant that was uh, originally from Mexico, from uh, the state of Puebla. And the story goes, uh, there's a very ancient uh, legend among the Mexicans that say that we owe the discovery of maize kernels to an ant. It was a black ant that told Quetzalcoatl, the Mexican uh, uh, god, you know, the fe feathered serpent, that there was these grains uh, in, a, in a mountain called Tonancatepetl, and so the ant showed Quetzalcoatl the way to the mountain, and that's how maize was discovered. And uh, after that, obviously, many gods related to the maize, uh, which was, uh, uh, you know, the, the main deity for the Mexicans in all of the cultures in Mexico and in the other uh, southern countries like Guatemala, Central America, and some countries in South America. We have many types of maize. Maize was not the plant as we know it right now. It breeded you know, with many different types of, uh, of uh, maizes. And uh, right now we have, I don't know, like 40, 50 types of different maizes. But what is amazing about maize is that uh, uh, with maize, you can't make a tortilla. No, many people don't know that you you, you think you you take a you know a corn a ear of corn and you crush it and you make a, a maize dough and with that you have a tortilla. No, totally wrong. The greatest discovery of all this is not corn itself, but nixtamal. The dough with which you make our tortilla is called nixtamal. And this incredible invention, we don't know who to, uh, I don't know who to clap to because there's no inventor or discoverer that is mentioned in the history of Mexico, who came up with the idea of having this alkaline water heated at night uh, with lime, just as the lime we use for construction. So you heat that water with lime and there, you put in the, the maize kernels, so, so they are softened, 
and then you wash them, you take out the hull, and uh, that's how you make the, 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 the basic ingredient for a tortilla. What is incredible about this process as well is that um, unlike maize, uh, nixtamal has much more vitamins and protein than maize itself. Uh, what this process of cooking provides is of a, of a thing called niacin, which makes possible to absorb vitamins. So that talks of a, an incredible tradition, and it can uh, show us that our very ancient people were very, very well fed because they ate tortillas, and of course they hunted and had game, fish, frogs, and insects, as we will see. And from the maize, a whole variety of different dishes can be made, uh, from uh, drinks like pinole, atole, etc., as well as alcoholic beverages when you uh, leave it to ferment. Uh, here is the nutritional facts. We, we thought it was important to have the nutritional facts of the tortilla in the book and you will find that it, it's not only not fattening, much less fattening than bread, but very nutritious for its vitamins, for proteins, et cetera, et cetera. An average, an average Mexican consumes 130 pounds of tortillas a year. Wow, <laughs> quite a lot. If, if we would have that without the Coke, we wouldn't have the first place in obesity on the planet. So flour, um, so we have the tortillas. They have always been made with the same process. Uh, the, um, uh, the nixtamal and afterwards you, you crush the grains with a metate, which is made out of volcanic stone. And there's where, where the woman traditionally makes the tortillas. It was not until 1947, imagine, when the first machine, uh, tortilla machine appeared with a guy named Celorio. But the, these machines have exactly the same technology as the first tortillas ever made. The volcanic uh, stones are the ones, uh, uh, I'm sorry, that crush the grains and that's how tortillas uh, come about. So we have many uh, uh, utensils, you say, well, uh, many things that uh, are credited for having a tortilla and to keep tortillas and producing tortillas. Instead of having a very boring list of everything that is involved in a tortilla, we thought we could make a lottery. So we made a lottery with all the, the, the different instruments that are involved in its uh, production. Where you have the tortilla press, the tenate, which is where you keep the tortillas. Well, obviously nopal, because you can make nopal tortillas, the taco maker, the metal stove, etc., etc. So this is a taco lottery, and uh, you can find all, the, all about it in the book. Then we have, obviously, the animals you put inside the taco. Uh, tacos, obviously, are made out of uh, the tortilla itself, because for making a taco, you have obviously a holy trinity, as we call it. The tortilla, the filling, and the sauce. So this book starts with the tortilla, then we go to the fillings, and uh, uh, the Spaniards, when they came, uh, brought along the animals that are usually now eaten inside tacos, because the ancient Mexicans, and in Mexico there were no cows, there were no sheep, no lamb, no, uh, no pigs. So um, uh, afterwards, you know, when, when they came, they brought these animals, which are now a, a, a very important part of making a taco. So we have the three basic animals that are uh, used to make tacos, uh, with their uh, part four, I'm sorry, including the goats. And now, you know, when we get to part two, it's taco time. And taco time means we're gonna make like a, a, a traveling through the 16 basic types of taco we have in Mexico. These are the 16 front pages of each type of taco. We put them together so you could see, you know, how they are very similar in their uh, layout. And um, the first taco we start with is the tacos on the grill. 
Of course, um, tacos on the grill are the most popular tacos. Uh, as you see in the, uh, in what is this, right-hand side, all the way to the right-hand side, we have a map of Mexico uh, stating in what part of Mexico these type of tacos are consumed. Then we have the animal it is made with, and uh, finally the instrument you use to cook it. So in all the 16 types of tacos, we have that reference. And we start, obviously, with the history of that type of taco. Uh, the grill, well, obviously, the, the first grills for the Mexicans were made with wood. It was a wooden bed or with, uh, even with uh, a maguey, which is a plant we'll talk about later. And they, they put their food before animals came with the Spaniards. They cooked dogs fish, game, etc. And uh, so uh, tacos on the grill became very popular, but especially in the northern part of Mexico. We will find out through the book that taco is such a rich, 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 rich uh, dish that it has thousands and thousands of interpretations because each region of the country has different um, a background and that produces a different type of uh, preparing the food and of, uh, uh, and of ingredients, obviously. So uh, tacos on the grill are eaten in the northern part of Mexico and uh, in that part, uh, they don't eat as much maize tortillas. Uh, the Spaniards who went to the northern part of Mexico brought along as well flour wheat flour, so uh, there's a custom there to eat the tacos with the flour. Here in the United States, flour tortillas are very popular. Uh, those are done with flour and a bit of lard to give them their plasticity and their flavor, so uh, that's the northern part of Mexico. And, um, you know, thinking about the, 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 uh, the, the way we talk about ourselves, the way we eat, etc., we thought that we had to put some of the popular culture sayings because everything we, you know, the double sense jokes, etc., we, we make, there are many related to the taco, no? For example, here we have one where the meat uh, del carnicero said that from the, the head uh, to the cola, that means to the butt, everything is bistec de bola, it's a way of saying that woman is woo, no? So it's, uh, so we have many of these uh, sayings uh, related to taco. For example, uh, you put a lot of uh, cream into your tacos means you're very conceited, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and instead of having, you know, dots to separate the paragraphs, we've uh, made these illustrations of people eating a taco. So every time you come to a separation of paragraphs, we have people eating a taco. And uh, finally, since it all started in a taqueria, we wanted to end each chapter with an interview with a taquero. Uh, being a taquero is one of the most uh, uh, um, incredible professions in Mexico. It is uh, sometimes inherited by generations, and people that know how to do tacos are very proud of their trade, and they're incredible to watch. So uh, this is, uh, and every chapter ends with the recipes, because although it's great to go to the best taquerias on the planet, and if you can, there's nothing that competes with that, but if you insist of making tacos in your home, we put a, the recipe of those tacos at the end of each chapter. And then obviously a, li a small list of the best uh, tacos in Mexico. Uh, then we have tacos on the griddle. Uh, the griddle was all uh, brought as well by the Spaniards. Uh, as I was saying before, we had uh, the, the, the wooden uh, stove, etc. And these tacos are eaten in the whole of Mexico. It comes from any animal. And what makes a difference is the preparation, the sauces, the chilies, etc. And according to the region, these uh, vary. So here, for example, we have a very famous song by a um, Mexican uh, composer for children music, Kikri. Uh, and this is called the Comal, which is the... Uh, 
ancient way of uh, cooking. The, it was a grill, but the ancient grill. And the, the, really, the grill is just a reloaded version of our ancient comal. So this is a conversation between the comal and the pot. And uh, so just to show you how uh, the taco culture is embedded in everything you can think about. And well, obviously, the interview with uh, this taquero, whom I love, and he's in the cover of our Mexican version. So this is the We love this guy because he says, well, coming, oh, what did I do? Coming to Yucatan, it, what, was it me? Uh, that's right. Uh, coming to, I mean, coming to Mexico and to Coyoacán and not eating uh, tacos at, El Chucapa, at the place called El Chupacabras is like going to the, to the zoo and not seeing the monkeys. So we love that, um, you know, what, what this guy said. So we uh, decided to put it uh, on the, I, I don't know if I missed some, uh, 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 yeah, well, there, we are, there we are. So this is the guy from El Chupacabras. And then uh, we have the very famous tacos al pastor. These tacos were uh, invented recently. Uh, they were brought obviously by the migrants from uh, the Orient, Arabs, Greeks, Indians, etc. It's just a, a vertical grill. But the, the an interesting thing about tacos al pastor is that unlike shawarma, giros, or doneraki, which are the oriental way of doing these tacos, in Mexico we substituted the lamb for pork. So most of the tacos al pastor are done with pork. And the important thing is how you marinate the meat during the nighttime. You have a, a, like a 24 hours marination of the meat and nobody knows exactly why it has a pineapple. So if anybody knows here why, where, who invented the thing of having a pineapple at the top, nobody knows. It has an onion at the bottom and this pineapple at the top. And these are the taqueros that are, you know, a feast to see because they can do loads, loads, loads of tacos in, in, in a, by the minute. And there are a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, when kids go to eat tacos, they have these uh, competencias, how do you say it, of how many tacos can you eat uh, uh, by the minute. So it's not only the making, but the eating as well. And, um, well, I have to say that Tacos al Pastor then suffered another transformation in Mexico City. This is the only taco or taco transformation we can be credited for, I think, which is to put onion and cilantro, that's coriander in the taco, which is called the garden. So you have tacos with garden, thanks to a Mexican taqueria called El Tizoncito. Then we have the barbacoa tacos, very easy to make. You just do a hole in your garden, about six feet deep. And uh, inside uh, the, the, the hole, you put some uh, volcanic rocks. You can get them anywhere, volcanic rocks. And on top of the volcanic rocks, you put maguey leaves, which is the plant out of which uh, it's different varieties. You get out tequila, mezcal, etc. Maguey is a very important plant in Mexico. So uh, they, they, they put this uh, maguey leaves and the lamb. It has to be a very young lamb, preferably uh, before uh, the lamb mates. That's a very, uh, they call it kid lamb, I think, uh, which is at least 45 days old. And they do this because when the lamb mates, it secretes a substance from, a, I don't know, it's like a hormone or something that makes the, the, the meat stink. So that's why it's preferable to, uh, kill a very young lamb. <laughs> and uh, so these are the barbacoa tacos. And this type, uh, besides being a special taco, is a type of cooking. So we use this uh, pit on the ground to cook many things, cochinita pibil, and many other dishes that are um, representative of different parts of the country. Uh, birria, for example, is a type of barbacoa, uh, but it's uh, done in a different way with different marination, and it has uh, 
soup. You always eat the soup with the, with the birria, and it's uh, specifically eaten in the central part of Mexico, especially in Jalisco, Guadalajara. Uh, I guess that many of you have been to Guadalajara, so when you go there, the thing to eat is birria. Uh, I'm gonna go a bit faster. How much time do I have? Because I still have like 13 tacos to go. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they had meat tacos. But I don't know. I, I don't eat head meat tacos, but our, there are people that would give their lives for a good head meat tacos. There is the part which is called maciza, which is the st strongest part of the head. And then obviously you can eat the cheek, the tongue, the eyes, etc. And then if you don't know which one you want, you can have a combination of everything, which is called a combo. So you can have all the head, you know, sliced into pieces inside your taco. Uh, these tacos are great because they are homemade every single day by usually the guy and his wife or just a guy or just a wife. But the, you can usually see around the country these guys with their bikes and the basket beside uh, and the back part covered with uh, some plastic. And inside that basket there's these tacos which uh, they, they heat, uh, they, they, they maintain the heat so you can eat them is usually like at 12 o'clock in daytime. So uh, if you go around Mexico, you'll see these guys, you know, just there in the corner, and you can have a taco sudado. They're usually filled with, uh, filled, I'm sorry, with beans or with mashed potatoes prepared in a certain way, and obviously meat uh, tacos, no? Then we have the carnitas tacos, which is uh, uh, pork tacos. And one of the great things about this taco is that not only the meat is used, but the skin is pressed and the thing called chicharron is, uh, is uh, eaten as well. And it's a big favorite with guacamole. Chicharron with guacamole is one of the uh, derivatives of this uh, type of uh, dish. Uh, then we have the chilorio tacos, which are eaten in the northern part of Mexico. Um, it's uh, again a taco which is uh, similar to chorizo, but instead of putting it, putting it in a tripe like you do with uh, salami or stuff like that, it's uh, just uh, eaten like that and it's a, a thing of uh, the state of Sinaloa. You probably have heard of Mazatlan and then that's where they eat this chilorio tacos. Um, Cochinita pibil is the most famous dish from the Yucatan Peninsula. Quintana Roo, Yucatan, and Campeche. And these type of tacos are done exactly the same way as the barbacoa and the birria, which you saw, with uh, this pit uh, on the ground, and they, they put exactly the same process, but with pork. And here, the interesting thing is the pork is marinated with a lot of sauces and spices that were not Mexican. All these spices came from Europe, like, uh, uh, for example, we have uh, oregano. They put uh, pepper. We didn't have pepper. Pepper is one of the uh, important ingredients for this. And afterwards, you have to put onion. We didn't have uh, onions either. You have to put those onions in a special type of vinegar, and then you put it on top of the taco when it's delicious. That, that onion is done, done with peppercorns as well. Uh, uh, the stewed tacos, which are my favorite, uh, because I stopped eating meat, <laughs> as you might imagine. The stewed tacos are um, any type of um, thing you can you know, cook, like uh, rajas, uh, chili rajas, um, vegetables like uh, the, the, the flour of the squash, which are delicious, uh, etc. guacamole and many other things that can be uh, done to eat stewed uh, tacos. And then this is my favorite. It, 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 we became so obsessed with this part of the book that we recently did a book especially on eating insects because insects are one of the most ancient traditions in Mexico, not only in Mexico, but in many parts of the world. And somehow insects have been satanized. They're like, seen like, like the devil itself <laughs> because, well, basically because of the movies and all the, the, the science fiction that always, uh, you know, the bad guy has 
the face of an insect. So we are uh, very scared of insects, if we shouldn't be, because insects are the, the li li living creatures that have the most uh, high content of protein in the planet. Um, if you compare an insect to a cow, it has like 30% more protein, and the process it takes to, to produce a kilo of protein of insects takes the third part of energy as producing uh, meat that comes from uh, cows, etc. So we think that eating insects will be the future of this planet. We became fascinated with the subject. I brought you published called Acridophagia, which means eating grasshoppers or crickets. And uh, I think uh, it's interesting to know how, uh, besides, you know, all the incredible dishes that are eaten, like uh, uh, crickets, the worms that grow in the leaves of the maguey, uh, the two types of worms, and the humiles, which you have to eat alive, I haven't eaten those, but it, it suppose then you know it crawls. No, you can see people eating those and crawling through the, the, to the faces with the people that are eating them, because the, the flavor comes out when you eat them alive. And obviously, you can eat all types of insects. But it, what what is incredible is that Mexico has the most important uh, number of edible insects in the world. We have 549 species of insects, which makes us a, a, a very rich country, and I hope we you know, can do something about it. Then insects are being processed to do flour with them, and it is the flour that has the highest protein content you can ever find. I think uh, there's a big industry here in Texas, and in Canada, they're doing this uh, flour thing as well. And now you have crunch bars, even uh, dog food made out of insects with very high protein content. Well, then we have the michote tacos, which are uh, pig tacos, but they are wrapped around a very fine layer that uh, the maguey has. Uh, this uh, outer layer, uh, with it you wrap the, the meat, and so it gives it an incredible flavor. Um, Sadly enough, the maguey is a plant in danger of extinction, so now they sell you these very fine papers which with you can wrap the michote around. And <coughs> my favorite as well, the seafood and fish tacos. We have two very large coasts in Mexico, the Atlantic and the Pacific, and fish tacos have become very popular. You have now, for example, fish tacos al pastor, which is marinated fish in the style of the pig uh, thing, but with uh, fish. And all through the coast, you have, ha you have uh, seafood and fish tacos that are fantastic, depending on the catch. For example, um, in Tijuana, a place called Rosarito, you have lobster tacos that are eaten with a gigantic tortilla called tortilla sobaquera, which is made with flour. And it's called sobaquera because it's so big you could put it under the armpit. And, um, and so these tacos are made with lobster. And what, it, what is amazing is that it, you put butter into it with rice and beans. And it's the most delicious thing you will ever taste. I strongly recommend that you go to Rosarito to eat these uh, lobster tacos or one of a kind. And uh, well, as you can see there, there we see where these uh, tacos are eaten. And finally, suadero tacos, which is uh, uh, different parts of uh, the body of the pig and, uh, and the cow. Uh, deep fried tacos, which are in kind of tacos that you deep fried them. And uh, we thought it was interesting to have the instructions to eat a taco. Not only, you know, you know, more or less you have an idea of the vast uh, array of tacos we have, and now it's important to know how to eat it, because if you eat a taco like this, all the guacamole and the salsa will, will drop in your shirt, which is uh, not good, and you won't look like a taco expert if you do that. So you have to incline your body, and you have to take the taco 
lifting your, your um, this finger like that because you can't hold a tackle like this, no? It's, uh, no, not done that way. And then, you know, everywhere where there's a taco place, there always is a dog, no, around. So you don't have to kick the dogs, they're friends, okay? <laughs> and, well, many people say, okay, but what about enchiladas and all the other types of tacos? Well, we b believe, okay, these are derivatives from the taco, but they're not a taco because you can't eat them like this. You wouldn't want to eat an enchilada like this. So these are like cousins of it to the taco, which are enchiladas, and of course we have thousands of, way of uh, ways of doing the enchiladas. The quesadillas, of course, which are not properly tacos because the tortilla is folded in another way. And strangely enough, although quesadillas means cheese with a tortilla, with the tortilla, uh, the majority of quesadillas are not done with cheese. So that's a mystery. They're called quesadillas because of the, it's the way you fold the tortilla, but inside you can find, um, I don't know, uh, uh, mushrooms, uh, the, the flower of uh, squash flower, I'm sorry, etc. So uh, then we have the very popular tlayudas from the state of Oaxaca, which are gigantic uh, tostadas uh, that can measure up to, I don't know, I, I don't know how to say it in, in, in inches, but very big. And uh, they're done with a very special cooking process with lard, with beans, with cheese, avocado, the meat of your choice, uh, especially tasajo which is uh, the meat they eat in Oaxaca, which is a meat that is cured in salt, and th that way you can keep the, the, the meat fresh for a long, long time. That way uh, the meat is done as well in the northern part of Mexico where not always we had refrigerators, so this way you can pe keep the meat fresh for a long time. So we have tlayudas, and then we have this appendix of all the near cousins of the tacos where we have uh, tamales, etc. We call it vitamin T, which are tacos, tamales, and it's what makes us strong. <laughs> so this is the vitamin T where we have the picadas, pellizcadas, salbutes, sopitos, uh, chambergos, gorditas, gorditas with pork rings, cazuelitas, etc., etc. And obviously the tamales, which are you know, another book in itself because there are loads of different types of tamales. And I was telling you in this holy trinity of the taco that entails the, the, the tortilla, the filling, there couldn't be a taco book without the salsas. So we have uh, the recipes for 30, uh, 36 different salsas. The main difference being those that you cook or those that are uncooked and obviously uh, the, the, the flavor depends on the incredible uh, number of chilies we have available in Mexico. And uh, we couldn't leave out the guacamole, which is a chapter in itself. And uh, there are many ways of doing a guacamole. Everyone can swear no, by the Bible, which is the best guacamole in the world. There are those who say that you absolutely have to put lemon into the guacamole, others that say that pepper, but what we are sure, very sure about, is that you don't put green beans in the guacamole. The U New York Times, which is a very respectful and fantastic publication, came out with this uh, attack, uh, guacamole recipe with green beans and, and, and everybody went crazy. Especially President Obama, who immediately tweeted, please, no, there's no the, the green uh, the peas Peas, I'm sorry, green peas in the, in the guacamole. And it finally came to in terms of agreement with Jeb Bush on the subject. <laughs> so that's a guacamole. And this is uh, the whole salsa. So uh, as we were finishing the book and having all these references to, the, to all the parts of Mexico that have all these different types of tacos, we figured out that our map is a map of a taco. So we did this topography to show the incredible, vast amount of tacos we have and that 
any region you go to, you will have a different type of taco. And within that region, millions of different types of preparing that taco. So this is just to show you how uh, the taco itself is a universe, and it's, well, I think, one of the most rich dishes we can eat. It shows that our culture is uh, embedded in a very, very rich antique uh, and uh, tradition that uh, makes us, you know, very proud of our food and of being Mexican, and I'm very happy to have shared this with you today. Thank you. Well, we, um, before going to the questions, I don't know how much time I have. No time? Well, there's a, no questions. But there, we did this, we did this uh, video. Um, I'm going to show you this uh, video just to show you what joy it is to eat tacos in Mexico. And I hope I can invite you all to, to uh, share this joy coming to Mexico and, of course, sharing this with uh, the many Mexicans that have made America a great country to live in. Thank you for, to all the Mexicans that have brought you the tacos here. And this is the video. Aparte de ser taquero de, de oficio, soy taquero de afición, ¿no? me gustan los tacos, pero los de suadero en especial, los que llevan carne en especial, me gustan mucho. ¿Qué es un taco? Parte fundamental de la comida típica mexicana. El taco está compuesto por una tortilla que está hecha a base de masa de maíz. Se prepara costilla, bistec, pastor, chuleta. Además puede ir con queso. Para los mexicanos, un taco sin chile, pues ya no fue taco. Que un buen taco es el que no cierra. Al envolver la tortilla, si no cierra, es un buen taco. Voy a roja primero. Un poquito de salsa verde. Los tacos de guisado aquí nosotros preparamos, te cuenta como si fueran comida para tu casa, así un guisado normal. Aquí nosotros lo preparamos, le ponemos tortillas de maíz, este, le ponemos arroz y el guisado que pues elija la, la persona. Tenemos cajas con crema, chicharrón prensado, huevo con jamón, bistec, en salsa roja con nopales.
Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.